it's an amazing time of year when we consider Christ's sacrifice on the cross, his death, the forgiveness of sin that we have through that sacrifice, his resurrection and post-resurrection. But when you look and consider that story, where are his disciples? You would think that they would be right there at the cross. We don't find them there. We find women worshiping him at the cross. And post-resurrection, we find the disciples gathered, cloistered together for fear that something might happen to them. Absolutely vacant from having a relationship with their Savior. In context of all of that, we're going to start a series today, a series on the family. But it seems before we start with our earthly families, we must look together for a few minutes with our spiritual family. Because I believe that God wants us to have two family units. How about you, friends? Christ had an earthly family, and he drew his disciples together that he might have spiritual relationships with his disciples as well. God wants us to be part of two families, our biological families and his family. As the family, so the community. As the community, so the state. As the state, so the nation. As the nation, so the world. And as the world, so the universe. So much depends upon our connection with our spiritual family. So what does the spiritual family look like? What kind of shape is it in today? We're going to look at the story found in Luke chapter 15. And we're going to look at it from several different vantage points and see where you belong in this story. It's a story of the prodigal son, which you know so well already. Do you know somebody who would fit the description of being a prodigal son or daughter today? Do you know somebody who would be a prodigal father, perhaps, in that story? Do you know someone who would be a prodigal elder brother? Where would you fit in the tapestry of that story today? Or where would you, if you're really uncomfortable doing that analysis, where would you put somebody else in that story? You might be more comfortable saying, oh, that person belongs here. But when you get done with everybody else, God's going to say, now that you're done with all of them, where do you belong in that story? For I find in that story an interesting mosaic. I find a father who waits. I find a father who welcomes. I find a father whose heart is warmed when the son returns. I find the prodigal who leaves. The prodigal who languishes. The prodigal who longs to return. A prodigal who loathes, loathes where he finds himself, and a prodigal who looks for the way home. I find an elder brother who is disappointed, discouraged, despondent, disoriented, distanced, and filled with despair. Where do you find yourself in that mosaic today? How is it in your spiritual relationship with your Lord today? I'd invite you to open your scriptures to Luke chapter 15. We're going to spend a few minutes there today. There, there in Luke chapter 15, we find three stories of the lost. Three stories of the lost that was found and the rejoicing that comes from, this, from the same. Luke chapter 15, 
Then drew upon, then drew near him all of the publicans and sinners for to hear him. The Pharisees and the scribes murmured, saying, This man receives sinners and eats with them. And he spoke to them, saying, What man of you, having a hundred sheep, if he loses one of them, does not leave the ninety and nine and goes after it in the wilderness, goes after the lost, until he finds it? And when he finds it, he lays it upon his shoulders. What does the Bible say? What does he do? Rejoicing. I love the story, don't you? I don't believe we probably have any real shepherds caring for sheep in our congregation today. Do we? Anybody done any shepherding? Story goes, if you have a hundred sheep and one strays, what does the shepherd do? He knows the 99 is accounted for. And he actively, proactively goes after the lost. He knows the 99 are safe. And he seeks that which is lost. And on the way home, he may have traveled over hill and vale to find that sheep. He's got the sheep on his shoulders. And he's rejoicing every step he takes. The lost is found. And he can't wait. And the fold is complete. When the one is brought back to the fold, but it's not full and complete until all are accounted for. How is it in your life, friends? How is it? Do you know family members who have wandered from the faith? Do you know friends and neighbors who give no evidence of ever knowing the faith? Do you have loved ones that you, God is counting upon, to reach. The second part of Luke chapter 15 is another lost part. It's a story of the lost coin. The, she the sheep kind of wandered away in its foolishness. Didn't know any better. The coin was lost through no fault of its own. In in verse 6, And when he came home, he called together his friends, saying unto them, Rejoice, for I found my sheep which was lost. I say unto you likewise, in verse 7, Likewise, joy shall be in heaven over one sinner that repents, more than the ninety-nine just persons who need what? No repentance. I'm glad that ninety-nine of you might be here. But God says we ought to rejoice when the others come and join alongside of us. Do you believe that, friends? There ought to be great rejoicing in, uh, in our group. Verse 8 says, either that woman, uh, verse, verse 7, okay, going to verse 8, either that woman having nine, uh, piece, ten pieces of silver, if she loses one piece, doth not light a candle and sweep her house and diligently seek it till she finds it. And when she had found it, she calls her friends and her neighbors together, saying, Rejoice with me, for I found the peace which I had what? Lost. The lost is found. Rejoice with me, for I found the peace that which is lost. Likewise, I say to you, there is joy in the presence of angels over God when one sinner repents. It was good that she had nine out of the ten but one piece was lost, and she went diligently in search of it. To use a poor, poor illustration, you have nine car keys, and you're going to start that car, and you're missing that one key. What do you do? You search, and you search, and you search, until you find that which is lost. How much more important is somebody to Christ than a simple car key? that can be replicated by a locksmith. You find that key, and you tell your spouse, your significant other, your aunt, your uncle, you know what, I lost that key, and I looked for two hours, and I found it. It was right there where I left it. It slipped between the cushions on the couch. It only took me three hours to find it. But we can't pick up the phone and tell somebody that Jesus misses them. How is it that in some ways we have so much enjoyed our relationship with Christ, but we've become 
so indifferent to the promptings of the Holy Spirit in reaching out for those who need a relationship with Christ today. Rejoicing when the lost is found. And then, and then the story that we've already read. The father, the two sons. We know it well, don't we? So where would you be in this story? Verse 11, a certain man had two sons. The younger of them said to his father, Father, give me the portion of my goods that fall to me. And he divideth unto him his living. And not many days after the younger son had gathered all of those things together, he took his journey into a faraway country and there wasted his substance on riotous living. Dad, I can't wait. After all, I'm 16 and a half years old and you're an old man. And I, I, I know, Dad, I know that when you no longer need your earthly goods, They'll be given to my older brother and me. But could you see fit, Dad? I'm ready. I'm already grown up. Would you give me my portion now? What you, what you may not understand, friends, in the culture of this day, when you were, you were, when you were disrespectful to the degree that this younger son was, asking for his inheritance early, the scripture says that a son or a son or daughter who disrespected his or her parent could be stoned. So this son was crossing the line culturally in so many different ways on so many different levels. But the father listened, and the father weighed. What do I do? The father thought long and hard. What should I do? Realizing the son was going to probably leave anyway. He gave to his son his inheritance. I don't know. Some of you are middle age. Some of you are slightly past middle age. Some of you are approaching the ages when the inheritance will be distributed sooner rather than later. But it takes quite a bit to say, here, take your inheritance now. And he went off and wasted his substance. And when he had spent all, verse 14 says, when he had spent all, there arose a mighty famine in the land and he began to be in want. And he went and he went and joined himself to a citizen of that country, being in great want. And he sent him into the fields to feed the swine. Now realizing the culture of the day, that working with the swine was something that a faithful follower just would never do. And having no food, having gone through everything that the Father had given him, he found himself feeding the swine and eating off the husks that the swine would eat. Now, where are you in the story? Are you with the father? Are you with the son who's done something that you regret having done? Finding yourself wandering ever so slowly into a distant country, far away from the father, until that relationship is broken. And when he came to himself, he said, How is it? How is it I find myself here today? My servants back in, back in my father's land has it better than I do. A little light comes on in his head. And he, he says, I really messed up. Probably had a few more stronger words than that. Maybe, maybe dad will take me back and I can be a servant to him. And maybe rather than feeding pigs, I can work in his field. I wonder what my father will say. The prodigal who had wandered 
so far away, the restlessness in his heart started ever so slowly. It was gradual. He looked for greener grasses. He looked at the disappointment and the excitement beyond what he had. He may have had anger and bitterment that nobody saw him. He wanted to move on experiencing, exploring the boredom and the sheer monotonous living. He wanted to strike out on his own. It may have been something the stress of a youthful life wanting to get away. And he came to the realization that God's Spirit was working upon his heart. And all he could do after the restlessness and the promptings of the Holy Spirit was to return. But that journey of returning was a hard thing for him at first. He went from being in the place where God wanted him to being ex estranged from his father, not knowing how to go about and how he would be received. And some of you here today, some of your friends, some of your neighbors find themselves in that estrangement. Maybe you find yourself wondering, what did I do coming to church today? I've been so indifferent. The good news is, the Father still wants you. The Father still wants the person you are praying for. The Father still wants us back. The restlessness that caused us to wander down that path, leading us far away from the Father, calls us to a place of turning around and returning to the Father. And so it, is, so it is. The Father doesn't run after the Son in this story. <laughs> I wish He had. I wish He had run after Him, slapped Him on His shoulders like the sheep, carried Him back. That would have been quite a great image. But He allows us the free will to choose. And God's Spirit says, return to the Father today. He takes that first step to that long step home. And as he approaches, he says to himself, I'll rise and go to my Father. And will say on him, Father, I've sinned against heaven and before thee. I'm no longer worthy to be called thy son. Make me as one of thy hires hired servants. And he rose and he came to his father. But when he was yet a great way off, his father saw him and the heart of the father had compassion. And he ran after and fell on his neck and kissed him. No waiting. Nothing could contain the father. The father was anxious. He'd go to his front porch and he'd look down that long path that led to his house longing for his son to return. And Christ looks down that long path of the cross and that pathway to your heart today, friends. And he longs, if you've wandered from that path, that you would journey down that pathway again today. He kissed him and the son said to him, Father, I sinned against heaven And in thy sight, I'm no more worthy to be called thy son. But the father said to his servants, Bring forth the best robe and put it on him. Put a ring on his hand and shoes on his feet. And bring hither the fatted calf and kill it and let us eat and be merry. For my son was dead and is Alive now. He was lost and now he's found. And they begin to be merry. I love the story. He's lost. He's found. He's a sinner. He comes home to receive the Father's robe with all of the implications there. Christ's robe of righteousness covering the sinner who comes home. The Father, He starts to tell him about 
how he had wandered away. And the father says, it's okay. It's okay. Put a ring on his finger and find the fatted calf. We're going to party tonight because my son has come home. Do you think it's good when Christians party and rejoice? Do you think there's a time and place? Do you think there's a time and place to say, Hallelujah, Lord, they're coming home. Thank you, Lord, for bringing me back. There's a grateful heart that is open to the Lord and tears of joy come running down their streaks as they're accepted by Jesus again. It doesn't matter what you've done when you've left Him. It doesn't matter where you found yourself. What matters is you've turned around and you're returning to the Father. But it wasn't all the case, was it? There were prodigals all over the place. The elder son. The elder son was in the field, and as he came, he drew drew to the house, he heard the music and dancing. He called one of his servants and asked what these things meant. What in the world is going on? What kind of party are we having tonight? I didn't hear anything. And he said to him, Your brother has come home, verse 27, and your father has killed the fatted calf because he received him safe and sound. And the elder brother, listen carefully, the elder brother was angry and would not go in. Angry and would not go in. How can it be The elder brother who had worked beside his father for years would receive a double portion. The elder brother who was faithful was feeling neglected, angry, would not go in. His father came out and entreated him. In the the original language, in the Greek, there's an imperative there. The father said, come, come rejoice with me. It's imperative that you come. And the older son, the older son's thinking, it's because of the, what the son has done in coming home. Ah, uh-uh. no, 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 no. It was the father who wanted to party. It wasn't the son, the younger son, who called for any party. He was ashamed of what he had done. It was the heart of the father that said, it's time to rejoice. He's coming home. But there was no rejoicing. For you see, when the heart is filled with bitterness, there is no rejoicing and praise in the life. And if there is no rejoicing and praise in the life, it may be because the heart is not filled with the Father's heart and passion for the lost. How is it, friends? You've been a a Christian for many years, and hardly anybody has shown you the praise that might be due a lifetime of faithfulness. Yet somebody else joins the church five weeks ago and they're made over because another person has come to join the Lord. And underneath, there's anger and hostility. Answered his father, said, Lo, these many years do I serve thee Neither have I transgressed at any time thy commandment, and yet you haven't even given me a kid that I might make merry with my friends. But as soon as thy son comes, which hath devoured thy living with harlots, people of the night, thou hast killed for him the fatted calf. He wanted to extract a public confession. And he said unto him, Son, thou art ever with me, and all that I have is yours. A double portion, in fact. For if you think of it, friends, the younger son had received his share of the inheritance. It was all gone. He had nothing to look forward to other than being a servant of his father. The elder son failed to realize 
what he had and what he had to look forward to. It was, it was met that we should make merry and be glad, for this thy brother was dead and is alive and was lost and is found. So, we find this story and pathway of the prodigal, starting with restlessness, coming to realization, a returning and a rejoicing. How is it, friends, in your life today? Do you find that you've wandered as the prodigal? Do you find that you've been indifferent? Maybe you're the father having a son, a daughter that's wandered away. Maybe realizing that neighbor you talked to last week. Do you find that people coming back to the Lord kind of bother you? Because the spiritual family rejoices when one comes to the Lord. Do you find that you have the older brother's heart that's a little bit hardened? Do you find that the Christian community is kind of strange to you? For when we look at and consider families, as we're going to be looking at a series here, when you look at the family, <clears throat> when you look at the family, we must first realize that this is not a story just about a prodigal. This is a story about the prodigal family. It's not one, but a family. If I remember the verse of Isaiah chapter 53, it says, how many have gone astray? All we, like sheep, have gone astray. And yet the shepherd has called us back. He's carried us on his shoulders into the presence of his Father. But he's placed upon us a prodigal family. Every single one of us the responsibility of returning to Him and bringing others to Him. I've invited you earlier, I've invited you earlier to take either a bulletin insert or a prayer card. And I'd invite you just now, take that card out, put your name on the top, your name and email address, we're going to do it all together right now. I see some of you reaching for your pen and your pencil. Just in the quietness of this place, your name, your email address on the front and underneath, put a line and somebody you want to pray for. Somebody that God is saying needs the presence of the Holy Spirit and the promptings of the Holy Spirit that they might return back to you. This will be a little different closing or closing our service today. I'm going to ask you to come forward. Just going to ask the organist to play a couple of verses of our closing hymn. And while she does that, just want you to get up. It'll be just a little bit of, uh, a little bit of chaos. You just come forward, drop your card on the front pew here, in the front pew here, everybody everybody has a name. Everybody has a loved one they should be praying for. So everybody stand up. Just stand. Stand collectively together. Take your green card. Take your, in, your, your insert, the name that God has asked you to pray for. I will be praying over these names. They're not going any place other than into my office to pray for. So... Just bring those forward at this time. Be in an attitude of prayer and reverence as we close our time together. From the back, come forward. 
place your cards 